Sure, you're, you're aware of being a spiritual being. That means you have grown enough to come to that awareness. Probably everybody in here is maybe close to that too because otherwise they probably wouldn't be here. This doesn't appeal to people who aren't on that path for the most part. Hi, Tom. Um, Hi. My question is about autistic children and how they relate to sort of the bigger consciousness and what it may mean that there's more autistic children now than there were before. Okay. And a kind of a side issue to that is uh, sometimes people ask me, well, you know, if people come here to experience, then what about the people who, you know, are, they get born and, you know, are autistic, you know, autistic, have that, or uh, die, you know, two days later, or live in abject poverty or terror someplace in a third world country where warlords are ravaging the countryside, you know, why would people do that? And there's kind of a, same, a similar answer to all of it as there is with the autistic children. There's several reasons. One, if you were to go to one of those um, societies where things were very rough, you know, some place where there were the warlords, and some place where just staying alive is about as much as anybody can, can manage but from, from day to day, and, and uh, food is really hard to get and you're hungry. That sounds horrible to us, doesn't it? Oh, what a terrible life. But you know, in such places, you know, I don't have experience in such places, but my guess would be that the relationships they have with each other are good and tight. My guess is there's a lot of love going around in those communities. Their physical world is tough, but it's not about the physical world. It's about the connections. It's about the relationships. It's about the caring. It's about helping each other. It's about dealing with what you have to deal with. So, in a way, you, you think that if, if the point of your, of your uh, incarnation here is to have a nice, cushy life and, you know, have things go your way, then they're not doing very well. But that's really not the point. Yes, they have terribly difficult lives, but they also probably have lives that are a lot richer than many of us living in luxury in the West. I suspect those people hang together and help each other and have love and connections that's very meaningful and very deep to them and they are beset with challenges that help them grow. That's not necessarily a non-growth bad idea to incarnate into such, a, you know, into such an area. Now, sometimes it's not for, let's say, autistic children or children that don't live long. Often the point of the lesson isn't for the child at all. The point of the lesson is for those around them, it's for the parents and the uncles and the aunts and the neighbors and everybody else to have to deal with that because that's a part of life. That's a challenge. And when you meet these challenges and successfully deal with them, you grow. This is not about smiles and good feelings. This is about opportunities to grow up, let go of ego, find those things that are important, find that love, find that connection with other people. Sometimes tragedy creates that connection with other people, and it turns out to be a positive thing. To the entity itself, let's say you have an entity that comes in and two weeks dies, uh, dies a, an infant or something. Well, as far as that entity goes, it's almost a trivial experience. You know, they're here a couple of days, they're gone. You know, it's like, uh, you know, if you took uh, 20 minutes out, you know, to watch TV and then went off and did something else. You know, it was just a pause. It's, so it's not like it was a great, awful, terrible thing that happened to them. It's a very minor thing. Spent just a little bit of time and effort and maybe they gave a whole lot of people a terrific, good lesson. And sometimes those entities are just just getting ready to get into this reality frame. And that's their first time. That's like walking over to the pool and sticking your foot in first before you dive in. So you come here for a few weeks or a few days or a few months and then get out. That's sticking your foot in and getting back out. So not to feel so much sorrow. I mean, yes, you feel grief and yes, it was a great loss. That's your lesson to deal with that but have to look at it from a big picture and not just from our, from our little picture. Thank you, I have one more thing to kind of add to that question. Um, mainly autistic children, mm -hmm. looking from their perspective as more of um, an evolved, more in tune with the bigger consciousness. Do you have any experience with that in particular? Yeah, I have done a little, uh, a little probing inside the minds of autistic children and 
An autistic child, well, you come, autism comes in all degrees, right? It can be very, very light, like Asperger's, and then it can be very, very severe, like they can't do anything for themselves. But an autistic person, child or adult, basically is living in their own reality frame. They're just not in this reality frame. They're in a different frame. This is a completely different reality frame. They don't see and hear and process data like we do. Now, not that they don't communicate, but they communicate in their own way, in their own, in their own style. And it's more of a, of a feeling kind of communication than it is an intellectual kind of communication. But they live in their own frame, and for the most part, at least the ones that I have interfaced with, they're not unhappy. They're not sad. They're not miserable in their frame. They're not sitting around thinking, oh, I can't do everything all the other kids do, because that's not in their reality. They don't feel that way. They're just kind of off in their own space. Now, are they living a richer life somewhere else? I would say that's not a bad metaphor. That's not a bad description. Yes, they're living their own kind of life somewhere else, but their body happens to be here. So it's a kind of a mismatch. So uh, yeah, they're living in their own world in their own way, have their own pleasures and their own happiness and their own things that are meaningful to them. They have relationship. You know, they do get connected with people, with things, with processes, and these things are all meaningful to them. Their life is not empty. We look at them by our standards and we think, oh, you know, how sad, but that's because we're thinking they, they have a reality like us, and it would be sad if we had to sit there and do what they do. They're, uh, they're generally okay, but they need to be taken care of here. They need services and attention here because otherwise their body's in this reality and they're, they're not good at at dealing in this reality. So they do need our help. Uh, Tom? Yes. Okay, in your construct that you've developed, uh, there's a greater consciousness and we're lower consciousness and everything is consciousness. Mm -hmm. So then it seems like so many things that we have believed where maybe were different things were actually metaphors. Mm -hmm. So does that mean like, you know, when we think about an evil force or, you know, that's represented by the devil or Satan, or when we think about victimhood, is that actually only certain degrees or states of atrophy? Um, yes. Um, and they're just metaphors? Yeah, it, there are negative beings. There, there, okay? there are. are negative beings, yes. So that's a different force than evil, the consciousness. Evil does, evil, no, it's all part of consciousness. When you're a, con you're a piece of consciousness, you're your, uh, your job, if you will, is to evolve. Now, you can evolve in two directions. You can evolve toward love. You can evolve by lowering your entropy through caring, through loving, through getting rid of fear and ego. There is another way to evolve. But the other way is the negative way, and it's limited. You can actually lower your entropy, also evolve, by control. You can control your mind. You can control your thoughts. You can get rid of those thoughts. You can focus your mind, and you can focus that mind to do bad things. You don't have to cure somebody's illness. You can give somebody illness. You see, it works both ways. Consciousness is just consciousness. The same mind that can cure an illness can give an illness. So if you evolve on that negative side where you use control, it's like control, power, force, in, or to, in order to decrease your entropy in order you get organized let's say in a negative direction then it's still consciousness it's just evolving in opposite directions now on the upside of the positive there is no limit you you evolve you keep getting more and more toward love until you become love and there's no ceiling there on the negative side you're using control to order your bits so that you lower your entropy ego control have their limitations. Pretty soon, it's, you hit a ceiling very soon. Okay, so the, here's the positive side goes up. The negative side gains a certain amount of power and just can't get much further because they become their own worst enemy. They have a lot of ego. They have a lot of, of uh, stuff that is destructive, that pulls them back down. They can't get past a certain point. So that's the, yes, there is negative, there is evil, 